Please pause the video and take a moment to read this important safety message. All right, a new series here at Blue Glow Electronics, and this is going to be a pair of series, and I'll call them kind of sister series in the making. Um, and the reason I'm calling it that is I'm going to do one series focused on how to troubleshoot um, tube based gear. I might slant it towards amplifiers, but it could be any type of tube gear. Uh, preamp, a ham radio, whatever. Um, and I'm going to do another series in parallel um, entitled How to Troubleshoot Solid State Gear. Um, primarily focused on audio gear, but you know we could go outside of that. The, um, and I do think the topics are unique and different enough to warrant separate series uh, because there's some nuances with tube gear that you don't run into with solid state and vice versa. And what, kind of what got me um, going on this whole idea of a troubleshooting series is there's a lot of guys I watch on YouTube and you probably do too and even a lot of my videos, you know, they're kind of... Um, they show you um, how to solve a problem, but maybe not how you figured out what the problem was to begin with. So that's the, the little angle I'm going to take here and try to uh, try to show you how to troubleshoot. So um, I thought that I'd start this video out today with this Fisher Model 20A amplifier. Um, I happened to get lucky enough to buy a pair of, pair of these off of a friend um, a couple weeks ago. And I've got them here at the house, and honestly, I have done absolutely nothing to either one of them. I have no idea whether either one of them works or not. And so that's what I'm going to kind of walk you through today, the beginning steps of that. So both, both of these amps were nice enough that um, I didn't care whether they worked or not. Um, I mean, as you can see, the cosmetic condition of these things. It's very rare to find these in great shape, very rare to find them with the cages still on them. Um, so I was I was lucky to put these in the collection here, but um, let's get started on the first things you would do when you buy a new piece of tube gear and you bring it home and put it on your bench, okay? First thing I would do if I were you would be to inspect the power cord, okay? So let's slide this over and take a look here at the power cord. One thing I will tell you I see a lot of, and that is power cords that somewhere along the way have been cut and taped back up and often many times not even soldered. So I always kind of check the cord out all the way through. I'm looking to see if it's frayed, broken. This one happens to be in great shape, very pliable, um, not brittle at all. And, and then the other thing I'm making sure of is that it's the right type of plug and that it, someone hasn't installed a, uh, a newer plug and maybe got the uh, hot neutral backwards if it was a uh, kind of a uh, polarized plug there. But this cord looks really good. So, um, you know, check your cord. If there is something wrong with the cord, you definitely want to consider replacing that. Next thing I would always check is the fuse. So you would not believe how many times I open up a fuse holder and what's on the inside is something that's been soldered up or uh, maybe a 10 amp car fuse, 20 amp car fuse and something. This says it needs a 3 amp fuse and I'm going to look here on this and sure enough we happen to have a 3 amp fuse right there. So um, we're in good shape on the fuse on this unit. Next thing is the fuse is not burnt up. Um, seems to have continuity and if you can't look and physically tell on a uh, on a fuse you can always get out one of your handy uh, multimeters and put it on continuity here and uh, test to make sure that when you touch the tips together you get a uh, a nice sound out of it which I'm oh hit that button there we go and then just kind of bring it over here and stick it onto each end of the fuse and looky there maybe we don't have a good fuse Ah, we don't have a good fuse. Let's go get a new fuse for this thing. All right, so we've got us a uh, new fuse out here. And if I can get my cords up here that got wrapped up. Um, as you can see here, we can now test on either end of the fuse here. And we should have continuity coming through this, okay? And that's kind of odd that you can't physically see. I mean, I want you to look at this fuse. You can, uh, let me move that out of the way. You can see the little bar going all the way through it there, but when you go to touch it on either side, 
no continuity. What has happened is that bar has broken loose all the way at the very end beyond where you can see up inside the metal sleeve on one end here. So um, do pay attention to whether it is a fast blow fuse, a slow blow fuse, or a regular fuse, okay? Look on your amplifier, maybe look on the schematic right here. It says 3 amp on this, and it doesn't mention uh, fast or slow, so I typically put in a regular fuse um, when that is the case. So, wow, we've already found one problem with this, which probably tells me, guess what? If the fuse is blowing on this amplifier or blown, there's probably another issue inside of it somewhere, okay? Okay, the next thing I do when I'm looking at a piece of vintage gear like this is I look and I, for the screws. Are all the screws in this amplifier? This one seems to have all of its screws here intact all the way around this amplifier, as you can see. There's quite a few of them. There's some that hold the top cage on, the ones on the ends here. And then you've got these ones here on the side and bottom that hold the... Uh, of the bottom unit in place. But um, a couple things I look for when I'm looking at screws. One, are there any missing? Two, are they the right screws? Have they been replaced with something other than the original screws? And three, how boogered up are they? If these screws are really reamed out or messed up, then that means somebody's been in and out of this unit a lot of times. The same as if you had like a all these other screws are brass, but then you get down here and here's a chrome screw. Well, you know somebody's been in this unit before. Not to say that that's a bad thing, and it's getting harder and harder to find vintage gear. Because this, this piece of gear here was probably made in the late 50s, early 60s. It's getting harder and harder to find a piece of gear that hasn't had, um, you know, somebody inside of it at some point in time along the way. But somebody's been in a lot or they didn't take good care of the screws when they were getting into it might mean that they were a little bit uh, you know subpar in their work or whatever so i always look at, at screws the next thing i will do is i will go ahead and open the unit up so i'm not going to bore you with me removing all these screws but that is the step we're going to take next here okay we've now got all the screws out of there i use these little um trays that have a magnet on the bottom of them and they'll kind of hold your screws um, as you can see here i thought maybe they were brass to begin with but it appears they're not because if they were they wouldn't be sticking to the magnet but anyway you can get these at harbor freight for just a dollar or two and uh very handy and i also love this little thing i got several different ones i got a ryobi and a skill they're just small little handheld this one charges with a usb charge um, but um, do a really good job of helping you with removing screws and not wearing your wrist out. But make sure you use good tips. A lot of the ones that come with these are kind of cheap. Um, I, buy, I buy like uh, DeWalt or Bosch, um, really good uh, number two screwdriver tips here. Uh, they work out quite well. Okay, next up we're going to take the top cover off of this unit. And boy, it looks still nice underneath here. Um, th the next thing I like to do is make sure that all of the tubes that are in the unit are the right type of tubes, okay? This says 12AX7, this is an RCA 12X7, which this unit would not have came with. It would have probably came with a, a Telefunken or an Amperex or a Mullard, one of the three. Any rate, uh, EL84, that's a 6BQ5, I don't know what brand. Um, another 6BQ5 um, in the EL84 slot. And you can see here, this one was made in 1957, the 20th week, um, and it is a um, Easy 80 um, Amperex um, tube. So we've got all the right tubes in the unit. You would not believe, guys, I'm being straight up with you, how many times I've taken the cover off of something, especially rectifier tubes, and you will find that the unit has the wrong tubes in it altogether. Um, somebody's put, you know... I guess people just see the shape of a tube and they try to match something close to it or find something that fits in the socket. You, as you and I all know that that won't cut it when it comes to a uh, tube amp. So we're in good shape here. We've got all the tube. I like to make sure that things are good and tight. Um, that, you know, these for whatever reason, these screws have not been taken off before. And it looks like the, uh, the can caps are uh, good and intact there as well. Okay. Up next, I'm going to take the bottom off, and this is not one of those videos where somebody's already gone through this amp, or I have, and I've uh, figured out everything that's right or wrong with it. 
and then I'm making a video after the fact. I, I just saw the cover come off this thing for the first time when you did. And look at this. I don't know if you can see this, but it's just covered in like spider webs and uh, and whatnot here on the inside cobwebs. So, and I can tell you this amp has never been restored, uh, but we're going to get into that more here in just a second. Good news about this amplifier is it's a mono amplifier, so there's not a, a lot to it. You know, it's fairly simple here. A um, couple things I like to do when I open an amp like this or a piece of tube gear is first thing I like to do is look around just visually. And there's a couple different things that I'm looking for here when I'm kind of doing this visual walkthrough. One, are the parts original? And I can just tell you anytime you see one of these types, of uh, this is a little mini mite, but anytime you see a capacitor with like a paper outer wrapped around it like this one has with the metal on each end, that's original, okay? These right here, these are uh, wax paper capacitors. These are original. This capacitor right here, I'm not sure on. It, it certainly could go back to the vintage of this amp, but it also looks like maybe there's a little bit of solder right here that looks shinier than the rest. So. This coupling cap right here may have been replaced at some point in time. And I can tell you this little cap and this little cap have not, okay? So one thing I'm looking for is anything in here been replaced before. Second thing I like to look for, are there any burnt spots anywhere, okay? Do you have burnt wires anywhere? Now this wire here certainly has like some, some uh, corrosion or something building up on it. Um, but... Uh, I'm certainly not seeing any burnt wires anywhere. Then I look for burnt components. And one thing I like to do, anytime you see a carbon comp resistor, tap on it a few times. Um, sometimes these things will be bad and burnt in half, but almost impossible to tell visually. And if you tap one of them once or twice, you'll see it split right open, um, and you'll know that you've got a bad resistor there. But I've tapped all these now, and it doesn't look like any of them are kind of burn up. Um, I'm not tapping them hard enough to break them. I'm just tapping them hard enough to kind of test to make sure. Oh, and over here, mm, lovely, lovely. Looks like we've got a black death cap over here, um, an old bumblebee style. We'll definitely uh, want to replace that with a modern safety cap of some type. Um, but these wire wound resistors, they don't typically do the same type thing as the carbon comps. Um, so, so far, so good. What I'm deducing, it all looks um, original and uh, doesn't look like I've got any resistors that are kind of broken. The next thing you want to look for down here where this capacitor is at is you're wanting to look to see if the capacitor is leaking anywhere. So do you have black stuff coming out, oozing out of the capacitor anywhere? And fortunately here, I really don't see any stuff oozing out of the unit right here. So it's possible that capacitor is still good, just because you don't see something oozing out doesn't mean 100% that that capacitor is good. We will have to go through and do a little bit of testing on it uh, to verify that. But thus far, visually, this unit is intact. Um, I don't have any loose wires anywhere. I don't have any wires that are kind of broken. All the components are in place. No broken resistors. No burnt spots. No leaking capacitor. So far, so good. So... Um, that would take me up to the next video, believe it or not, which I was going to make completely by itself, which is going to be on how to bring this unit up on a Variac. So I'm going to call this one a wrap just on how to go about inspecting your piece of tube gear before you even ever power it up. And I think we've done a good job of that. All right, I hope you enjoyed video one here. And like I say, some of these will be shorter, some will be longer, but I'm just going to keep walking through and showing you how to troubleshoot things. Um, one thing I did want to mention is with tube gear, you notice I went through these initial steps of really doing some inspection before I powered it up. Very, very important, okay? Not so much with solid state gear, but this whole act of really inspecting a piece of tube gear, making sure the right tubes are in it, making sure you don't have leaky caps, making sure you don't have burn up or broken components or whatnot, or uh, maybe a hack job inside of there, things have been replaced, uh, maybe not done properly. You want to do all that before you bring a unit up on a Variac. And I just wanted to drive that home with tube gear. 
Never buy a piece of tube gear, bring it home, plug it right into your electrical wall outlet. Um, you risk burning up a power or output transformer that might be either very costly or next to impossible to replace. So um, definitely follow this video and the next one I'm about to make before you ever uh, bring one of these things up. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. Um, onward to part two.